Our guests today are two respected members of our business community here to discuss how our island can recover from the COVID-19 shutdown. Dr. Tusi Avegalio is the director of the Pacific Business Center program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and Sherry Manor McNamara is the president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce Hawaii. It's not yet time to end the stay-at-home order, yet many of Hawaii's businesses are facing an uncertain future. Across the nation, COVID-19 has frozen large sectors of the economy. Recent reports show that Hawaii's dependence on tourism has made Hawaii's unemployment the highest in the country. And so as we hunker down to do our part to stop the virus, many local people have responded by adapting their businesses and their products to meet the needs of COVID-19 shutdown. But one day, we will be back to work and there are so many questions on how to get there. Sherry has worked at the state legislature, the ESPN Hawaii Bowl, Estee Lauder Companies, and the Sony Corporation. She serves on national boards, including the Association of the Chamber of Commerce Executives, the Council of State Chambers, and the Committee of 100 for the U.S. Chamber. The Chamber has been forced to urge Governor Ige to take action to support our local businesses with stabilization measures to allow these businesses to survive long enough to reopen and contribute to our long-term recovery. Dr. Tusi is the director of an award-winning program at the Scheidler College of Business, and he is widely recognized as the Pacific business, economic, and community development expert. He is also an expert in disaster response and recovery with his Samoan Ali'i roots, his unique perspective serves as a bridge between academic traditions and the traditional beliefs of Pacific Islanders, bringing together social, cultural, and spiritual values with human understanding. So I guess I will start first with you, Sherry. Uh, lots of things going on out there and things changing daily. Can you let us know what's going on out there with all the businesses? How are they doing? Sure. Uh, before I start, just wanted to uh, apologize in advance that, you know, you might see some people walking in the background like my <laughs> husband. <laughs> we live in a condo and his office is right next to mine. And so I know uh, we are having an important meeting here. <laughs> exactly. And then our dog might be running around and barking. So I apologize in advance for that. Uh, well, thank you for having me um, uh, on this uh, segment and really appreciate you reaching out and wanting to hear the concerns business. You know, for the chamber, we've been working from home since, uh, gosh, March 16th. And since then, many businesses were um, also making that move before the mandatory, or mandatory shelter in place. And so from that time, from March 16th, we've done uh, three surveys uh, to get the pulse of what businesses are doing, how are they preparing, and what the concerns are. And this was, uh, let's see, the first survey went out uh, the March, I think it was 20th, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or the early, the following week. And we, when we surveyed our members, and this was statewide in partnership with the neighbor island chambers, it was very, um, um, concerning what the, the numbers came out. Uh, half of the businesses we polled said they were shutting their doors uh, or um, making modifications to hours, uh, positions, benefits. So they were, they've been affect, being impacted by COVID from the very beginning. And as you, can, as you can imagine, we're one month, a little over one month in, so the impact is, has just multiplied uh, it's no longer week by week or day to day. It's even hour by hour as to uh, how businesses are managing the situation. And many of them are in the last lifeline. How can we resuscitate the situation? Because a virus uh, has become an economic virus and they are not, any business is not immune to this. Every business has been impacted in varying degrees. Now, have you heard from businesses that recognize that uh, things will never be the same and they're deciding to close? 
You know, we have heard um, from businesses uh, through other businesses as well that, you know, it's, they just can't survive anymore uh, because again, many of them were on their last lifeline. Their expenses far outweigh uh, the income that they have or the reserves they have, especially for small local businesses. And so there's a cross point where, uh, or last stage where you have to decide, okay, well, I, I just can't go on anymore. And that's why it's very critical that we got the federal support, um, but we also advocated for state support as well. Uh, and whatever the counties can do to help mitigate uh, the economic impact it's had on our businesses. Uh, businesses are adjusting. I mean, they have been forced to adjust, obviously. Um, as you can see, the restaurants, you know, they're open, but they've had to adjust the way they do business, no longer walking through the doors and being in a big crowd and, you know, table next to others. It's more takeout, uh, coming up with different packages, uh, different promotional efforts. And so businesses are forced to adjust uh, in, in this current situation. And now we have to begin pivoting. Okay, once we do start opening doors and restarting economy, what does that look like? And so what are people saying in the business community and tell us, Tusi, you can, you can um, let us know after we hear from Sherry. What do they say that the future economy could look like? Yeah, I think we can uh, all agree that the visitor industry, tourism industry, uh, is our number one economic driver and the devastation it's had on the tourism industry and thousands of jobs lost um, is just unimaginable and it's hard to embrace but it's happened and so obviously we need to re uh rebuild that industry but now it's also a time to really really and i know we've talked about economic diversification for a long time uh and, but now we really need to all come together talk with each other and determine what does that diversity look like? Um, there's many opportunities, but how can we coordinate it in a collaborative and connective approach? Uh, and those are discussions that are happening right now with the formation of uh, the state economic recovery task, uh, group that's led by Ellen Oshima. Uh, and there's other discussions being um, held as well. So I think more now than ever, we need to support our visitor industry but also look at economic diversification and really um, put our thinking caps on and just focus and build it. We had some concerns coming in from people who are not in the big industries in Hawaii and they, they looked at that group that was assembled and they said, you know, this is just gonna be another group that bails out the big guys and all the, the, the smaller businesses and organizations are going to be left out of the discussion. Have, have you had any of those concerns brought to you? You know, we have to start somewhere. Uh, and it's as far as the Chamber of Commerce that represents uh, more than 80% small businesses and small businesses meaning less than probably 20 employees. Uh, you know, we have been the voice for them. And so as we sit on different task forces or different discussion groups or, you know, even um, uh, uh, through this economic recovery initiative that the governor is pushing, uh, the ch chamber has been a conduit of information. And so that's why it's critical when we send out surveys to our membership or even the broader community in partnership with the neighbor island chambers uh, it's critical that we get the input and feedback from businesses so that we can ensure that they have that information to um, incorporate as they map out this um i, I guess they call it hawaii 2.0 thank you so dr tusi uh, you studied polynesian economies and you have been working with various governments across the Pacific to come together with Hawaii. From your perspective, what does the future economy look like to you? Well, uh, I think there's, um, I think uh, there's a book by uh, Robert Kuhn, I believe, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, and it talks about paradigms and paradigm shifts. And there were some major, major examples that he used in history. 
I think we're in the process of going through another major, major paradigm shift. And a paradigm shift basically is moving away from assumptions and beliefs and values that no longer make sense. So you can hold on to them, but if they don't make sense, eventually people discard them. So the thinking of returning back to what was may not be the best strategy because what was got us here in the first place. So the most important thing I think that I learned in the islands, uh, were, they, feel, they, they sort of face this sort of situation constantly is the need for innovation. And um, innovation uh, in a context that is to me appropriate for our, our region. And since I'm primarily in Polynesia, but I travel through Mic Melanesia and Micronesia, what inspires innovation is not just data and technology, but, but spiritual dimensions, the, the, the intuitive sensing. And, um, and if there's something I learned in, in, in traveling as a, as a Polynesian academic, and then also as a traditional leader in these different places, the, first, the most important thing I learned is that we can heal with our humanity, things that we cannot cure with our science, but we tend to, not engage that dimension that so is not sort of intuitive. If you can't measure it, therefore it has little validity. And another example of the, the paradigm shift. 10 years ago or earlier, just, just look at the language. We talked of building, fixing, sustaining, and globalization. Everybody embraced those those, those, uh, those terms. With the shift, I'm now seeing that we need to reframe these terms by using words that are used in the islands, in the Pacific. Growing instead of building, healing instead of fixing, and regeneration instead of sustaining, and most important, localization instead of globalization. So when you change that, it sort of moves things in how you think, because when you change your thinking, it adjusts your solutions. And one of the, 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 the most difficult things is I, at the College of Business, we're, we're, we're hardcore data-driven in most everything. But uh, in our case studies and what we've been able to see <laughs> is that uh, uh, there tends to be little trust and intuition. But I've reviewed several cases and, and actually experienced them where, 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 where groups or organizations or individuals who don't trust in intuition, they have a tendency to overanalyze data, second guess choices, change direction and cause delay, slowing down progress. However, people who claim that that's the only way to go need to be reminded that um, great leaders, uh, in fact, let me make a reference to a business leader, uh, Bill Gates, he refers to intuition as a major component of his decision-making. Albert Einstein, I mean, if you wanna talk quantitation, qu quantification, read his work. And he says the only real valuable thing is intuition. And so by engaging uh, our intuitions together, uh, we advocate the, 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 the weaving of traditional wisdom with modern uh, science, knowledge, and technology. It's that weave that will help us get to where we need to go. It's not either or. It's taking the best of both and creating a third option with value added. And then having individuals with the appropriate and the most effective skills of leading that. Because not everybody can do it. You've got to have certain skills, certain gifts. And, um, and I'm, I'm actually kind of excited because I think they're here, they're out there, and we will get through this. And, and it, uh, but we need skippers who are willing to turn into the wind 
and reach for those shores yet untouched. These are people who are not only innovative, creative, but also courageous. And we have no lacking of those kinds of individuals. So I'm, I'm kind of excited. Well, thank you so much for your insight. I can, I can tell you how I feel as a leader is I never want to be a victim of the outside world again. That I want to make sure that the people are fed, that they are not afraid of outside disease killing us all, and that we're no longer a victim in our homes. We can't even go outside anymore because of what the outside world has brought in. I think you're very correct to say that um, that the way things have been is how we got here uh, to begin with. And I can tell you that I believe the way forward is certainly we will have some tourism, but it's not going to be the way it was before. The only solution to a successful tourism um, economy is one that no longer destroys the land, no longer completely uh, outnumbers uh, the residents and takes over private places, but a thriving tourism where in the 1980s, we had the same income, uh, the same type of income and with inflation, um, our, our citizens were making more in the tourism industry as workers. And now we have double the tourism and the same type of income that more of an impact on us. I've been talking to different tourism leaders and I said, after 9-11, what happened to your industry? And they said, oh, we were devastated. And I said, what happened, what happened that made it good again? They said that the airports and TSA improved their screening to ensure that the things that got through that caused um, or allowed people to take over airplanes and to, to blow things up were no longer on the planes. And so what does that mean for this situation? And I said that for tourism to survive and and thrive, you're going to have to pretest everyone that comes here. Originally, we were talking about making sure everyone's tested at the airport, but no one's going to get on the plane if they think the person sitting next to them is going to give them some type of virus. So this is certainly something that I know that um, different leaders are talking about. Environmentalists are looking for this as an opportunity to maybe go back to the tourism of the 80s, where again, we had similar income to our city and our state but one that uh, didn't impact us so negatively and did not make us so dependent on that income uh, to survive. So Sherry, tell me, uh, welcome back, Sherry. Thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I was so many Zoom um, meetings, it's the first time it dropped, so I apologize for that. <laughs> no problem. Um, tell me what kind of collaborations it's going across um, with businesses and industries to help up speed up um, or, or come up with some solutions, financial solutions to speed up their recovery and most importantly to, to hold them over until we can make adjustments. Yeah, well on the federal level, as you know, the Paycheck Protection Plan um, that passed out of Congress and signed by the president, um, the funding that was provided was, uh, was depleted, right? It was. Um, <coughs> It was a mass surge of businesses applying for the loans, um, as well as the economic dis disaster injury loans. Uh, and within days, it was depleted. And that goes to show the unprecedented um, um, the, the, uh, need for these funding um, based on just days of it being depleted. Uh, and so at least that will help in tying um, businesses at least until the end of June, uh, and unemployment insurance the extended um, six hundred dollars for you know from the feds. That will you know it's obviously um, we want more, but at this time, hopefully it'll tide over, and then once business is open, we can restore positions uh, and get our employees back on payroll. Uh, but and then. In Congress, too, they just uh, on the Senate side, they just passed an additional funding, I believe $310 million for the Paycheck Protection Plan programs, and then another um, um, percentage reserved to the smaller, more of the community banks. And so we're encouraged by that because many businesses 
uh, they didn't, they applied, but they didn't get the loans and some didn't have an opportunity. So hopefully this is another chance for them to get those loans. Uh, in addition to the federal support, again, as I mentioned earlier, we are pushing for state, some kind of state support uh, and have, uh, you know, ask the administration to consider what kind of relief it can provide temporarily as businesses can make that transition or keep the doors open. And hopefully most of them transition to um, opening their doors. But it's now, it's even more critical to work collaboratively. And that's bringing different business organizations together, um, bringing the public side stakeholders together um, as well as labor, as well as um, other stakeholders to come together and really work together and um, addressing the critical needs of now. And again, as we look forward um, and growing um, our, our economy, diversifying our economy. I think one of the things that business and just regular residents are struggling with, uh, while they appreciate the stimulus money they appreciate um, uh, not having to, not getting evicted. They appreciate not having to pay their rent mortgage. The problem is, is they still have to pay that eventually. And all this money is going to run out at some point. As part of the city and state's response, I've been looking at the city and the state uh, taking, using their good credit rating that they both have right now to take out large bonds to defer, completely defer all payments of general excise tax mm -hmm. and defer all payments this year of property taxes. And of course, it doesn't mean you don't pay that back, but you yes. pay it over maybe a 10 year period. Uh, yeah. This is an unprecedented crisis. And so we have to come up with new solutions. How would that help uh, yeah. the business community and, and local residents? I think obviously anything helps right now and we need to be innovative in our approaches. So um, one, thank you, uh, Councilman Pine, for introducing legislation to provide some kind of deferment of property tax, as well as a number of other resolutions. So we appreciate that. Uh, as well as you said about the bonds, and um, Senator Schatz actually had an uh, um, innovative and good idea as well. And I believe Uhiro came out with this idea, and similar to what you said, uh, it's called the Federal Reserve Municipal Liquidity Facility. So Honolulu will be qualified for that. But essentially what you said about um, selling bonds in exchange to getting this, uh, this um, amount of proceeds um, that could be applied towards providing some kind of relief to um, businesses as well as um, our people in general. So now's the time to really be innovative and creative and look at all the different resources that are out there. And I'm sure there are. It's a matter of um, tapping into them and see what we can do. And, you know, businesses don't want to just take money. And, you know, it, when it comes to rebuilding, they give back. In fact, it's happening right now. Many businesses are doing some amazing um, uh, work and contributions towards the greater good. And that's why we are launching our 1808 campaign that while we are in these challenging moments, there have been some um, really positive uh, work and collaboration being done. For example, some manufacturing facilities such as um, Kohana Rum, Maui Brewing, they're repurposing their manufacturing facilities to create hand sanitizers, uh, you know, because we need more of that. Um, as well as we're hearing different restaurants, you know, donating their food to uh, to um, you know, our frontline people um, and the food bank, many um, businesses contributing to the food banks. And so there's a lot of great things going on. It just goes to show that, you know, in Hawaii, we are one family and uh, we will, will be resilient and we will support each other. And so, um, you know, while businesses are in need right now, uh, and hopefully we can continue to get that kind of relief and support, hopefully that will enable us to get back on our feet uh, much quicker uh, and defeat this virus and do it in a very collaborative way. So Tuesday, I asked this question to Kalani last week and you, know, you provide such an interesting balance. You talked about the importance of doing things a little differently in the future. And so the question that was asked, and this was actually by our the people that asked us questions to ask you and as a, a, a 
a native a Samoan ali'i uh, from the, our family there, uh, and a leader there, and a spiritual leader here and there. Is there a spiritual uh, reason for this virus based on um, a lot of your teachings throughout your lifetime? Well, it's very difficult to, to basically speak for nature. Yeah. But when you see nature thrive, when it has been suffering, I think that provides its own answer. I recall uh, reading about um, satellites showing the pollution has uh, dissolved in many high concentration areas around the world. Rivers are cleaning up. Animals are coming back into their natural habitats that had been where they had been driven out and occupied by human uh, by uh, human communities. I mean, um, when you see nature thrive, something good is happening, and and that's the way nature is speaking. And so many of our uh, elders would would interpret it in that way. So you can also interpret it the other way, but I think. Uh, um, from what I've learned, I trust my intuitions. Uh, I might also add that um, I, I'm really glad that uh, we share the a strong sense of the importance of um, innovation and localization. Um, what's very, very important is the ability to get beyond our paradigms and start looking very closely and critically at our local resources. And one of the beautiful things about being director of the Pacific Business Center is because innovation is what we're about. I've got some of the best staff. Uh, they're all nationally recognized as business developers. They do market product analysis. They write business plans, except they're really good and my biggest problem is trying to hold on to them because everybody wants to hire them out, but they're still with me. They're really great. But uh, let me give you an example. Um, a little known fact, in fact, when we started the research and development and started uh, sharing the information, there was little interest. It was on breadfruit. Everybody just saw breadfruit as something that ripens and causes insects when it splashes on the ground and, 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 and a real big problem. Well, this is, that was back in 2010. This is 2020. And our research findings provides a wonderful opportunity for the state to look at a, a, a promising industry. Rather than cookie cut what had been done before, here's an opportunity to really build on a resource that we can basically grow and cultivate in abundance. Um, meat protein is being overtaken with plant protein. Do you know that? Yeah, you're looking at the marketing studies, and I get that. Plant protein is probably, uh, they, they projected by, by uh, 225, will overtake meat. We got an entire generation of, 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 of people, uh, particularly young ones, who are now wanting things that are healthier, et cetera, et cetera. Well, our research shows, and very little known, but it should get out there pretty soon, that the breadfruit leads all protein sources, or plant protein sources, by head and shoulders. You know what that means? That means with, with, with breadfruit and the processing of breadfruit as a source of plant protein that can be used for so many other things, that's huge, especially when you realize that the projections for 2025 for plant protein is $40.6 billion. It's only five years away. Red fruits, low glycemic and gluten free. We're working on that processing so that we can actually manufacture products. 2025 projections for that is $32.39 billion. It, it goes on and on. We, uh, the, the breadfruit leaves and flowers. Um, they, U.S. Department of Agriculture and U.S. Department of Defense and the Breadfruit uh, Institute in Kauai did, a, did an analysis 
um, burning it to test the smoke because it's used in many of the islands uh, to ward off uh, flying insects. They discovered that it has three components more potent than DEET, the leading pestilence on the shelf today. And that's from the leaves and the, and the fluorescence, which usually just drops on the ground. And the insect pest market is $27.5 billion by 2025. So my point is, we've got multi-billion dollar industries and market opportunities from a tree that has been thriving and often cut down and removed here in the state. But for some reason, it, 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 it clashes up against the paradigm. And so we're not fully utilizing these amazing, amazing gifts that are being used everywhere else in the islands, but on a smaller scale. So somebody says, well, you don't have enough breadfruit. Of course we don't. But this is why you collaborate with an entire region. Oceana is 3.2 million square miles, 10,000 islands, and breadfruit grows on every one of them. So by working together and creating a, a marketing a strategy with, with the islands of the Pacific, we can, we can channel a lot of that uh, breadfruit here to the state of Hawaii. There's no reason why Hawaii can't be the center of breadfruit processing, manufacturing, uh, and distribution to the world because there is no such place right now. And as the word gets out, uh, the most recent one, sorry for taking up time, is that you ever heard of squalene? Squalene is extracted from the liver of sharks and it's a major uh, uh, um, moisturizer that's, that's used in the cosmetics industry. Very, very, very expensive. Unfortunately, for every thousand pounds of squalene that they extract from the liver of sharks, uh, 1.3 million sharks are slaughtered. And so it, it's horrid because sharks are akin. Well, our R&D people, again, said, guess where an amazing source of squalene can be extracted from? Breadfruit leaves, fluorescence, and the male flower. Let me add on to that. The, um, what is it? Uh, the oncology research shows that squalene um, has an effect on anti-tumor, anti-cancer effects uh, against ovarian, breast, lung, and colon cancer. So the medicinal side of this, I mean, the research is going, it's going to climb, I assure you. But anyway, those are just a, a few examples of, of the actual agricultural resource that have been under our noses since the first ancestors arrived. And that's not to talk about the technologies that we're developing at our incubation center, which converts waste into, into byproduct, commercially viable byproducts and products, as well as it helps to clean up the, 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 the environment. And technology that converts uh, seawater into fresh water uh, with minimum 500,000 gallons a day. These are small little technologies, micro island solutions for global challenges, and it's happening right now. So, sorry. We're gonna give you a whole show to see. You, you and Kalani, <laughs> it'll be 10 hours. <laughs> but I think what you just talked about though, it shows that uh, you, have, you and your team have been ready for this moment. And now's the time for the state to start supporting innovative ideas that one does not keep us dependent on a tourist economy that is dependent on people to support us, but also adds into that equation an economy that improves our environment by planting more trees, Ulu trees, and, and, and also an economy where we can feed our own people. And um, I'm working on looking at some federal laws that I find is very interesting that has really hurt the farming industry where we there's actually laws that say that we have to have these special inspectors come from the mainland to inspect our our farms that are producing food that are in um, places like Safeway and 
and food land and that they tell us how we're supposed to farm. And of course that type of farming uh, was created in government to make sure that certain really wealthy, wealthy, large farming organizations on the mainland um, have monopoly and it hurts local businesses like ours that are trying to grow their own food. So there's, this is a great opportunity for us to look at federal, state, and city laws that has prevented uh, innovation and self-sustainability here in Hawaii. I'd, I'd, love to meet, I'd, excuse me, I'd, I'd love to meet a, 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 a breadfruit farmer from Minnesota that, that, that are, are breadfruit more effective. Yes. <laughs> well, they, really under the current federal laws, you see, they would tell you, I'm sorry, you're not doing this correctly, that you have to use this type of insecticide um, uh, or use this type of fertilization that you can only get, of course, from the mainland. So uh, this moment, as tragic as it is, it has opened the door for us to, to fight for our own rights of survival here in Hawaii. And let me ask you, Sherry, you, you've heard what Dr. Tusi said. Uh, tell me some of the things that we can do in Hawaii uh, to help to create this type of collaboration of a new type of economies and new businesses in Hawaii. I, I think, um, and I agree with um, uh, Tusi that innovation is key, right? I think that's the only way to keep moving forward um, and moving forward, you know, so that we become resilient to situations that we're currently in now. And here's an opportunity where um, many of the brain power on this island can think of these different ways of addressing uh, our challenges here uh, in an innovative way. And we have great uh, uh, accelerators here element accelerator, we have blue startups, um, and a number of other um, um, accelerators. Uh, and so this is an opportunity now to come up, lever leverage our um, attributes here and <laughs> in conjunction with innovation. So I think we're gonna see more of that as relates to the um, Economic Recovery Task Force. I know the process will include a very open process in engaging input, whether it's through virtual town hall meetings, uh, through surveys, um, other digital platforms, and really discussing sustainability um, and a, a, a renewed or new direction for Hawaii that addresses some of the challenges we, we've had um, and what uh, Tusia mentioned earlier. And so I think that there's a, there is a bright spot out of this, and that is that people are going to be more collaborative in our um, way of thinking, and innovation is going to be a key aspect of that. Thank you. We had a lot of questions coming in, so I don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, so uh, this particular question uh, is from Tom at Opal Fields. Hi, Tom. I met you a long time ago when I bought, a, bought some jewelry from you. <laughs> It says for um, Aloha Dr. Tusi, I'm having a difficult time understanding how we're balancing the destruction of our economy in an effort to save lives. What consideration uh, would you, uh, hold on a second, give to lives lost by those who are a victim of the economy as opposed to those who are victims of the virus? Our 2019 GDP was about seven, 97 million. Considering the growth, we are on track for 3 to 4% for our 2020 GDP. How much of this projected 100 billion GDP is our economy going to sacrifice as a result of this shutdown? To add, what is our government's plans uh, to recover from that, that loss? And please don't tell us to cut teachers' salaries by 20%. And I don't agree with that either, Tom. To further add, uh, where is the money going to come from to finish the train, which will at this point be dilapidated with rusted train cars and, and falling concrete? Uh, well, that was a long question, Tom. <laughs> well, I'll let you answer what you can to see that was directed towards you. Well, it, it depends on what kind of metrics that you use to, to, to advance your point. 
uh, the metrics we use basically um, deals with resilient communities, how resilient is the community, uh, food security, is food security stable enough? For, uh, let me give you an example. Over 600,000 um, people in the state of Hawaii uh, are pre-diabetic, diabetic, or diabetic uh, uh, type 1 and type 2. Primary cause of that is uh, diet, imported processed foods, high glycemic, high gluten foods. Well, what if we created an industry that provides a substitute for high glycemic diet and uh, uh, gluten-free foods? And that industry is developed and owned, managed and operated and staffed by people here in the state. That metric, there's, there's actually four major metrics that, that we, that drive our issues, not just the monetary side, we leave that to the economists because we're an innovation business development uh, program. First of all, the first question we need to ask, are our children and our elders uh, well-fed and healthy? That, that's before how you, uh, budgets, et cetera. The second question, are our elders cared for with love and respect? The third question, are our women living without fear so that they can engage in the responsibilities and obligation of a mother? And four, are we living with balance, harmony, and respect with mother nature? Those are the four metrics we use to develop. And if you do it right, it's, it's in our view, very cyclical. It helps feed and it helps grow and it helps enriches. So if you're using only financial capital to measure effectiveness or, or productivity, um, that's good. But we use another metric, spiritual capital. And that comes in and it provides other means, like I, like I said in the beginning, that it's through our humanity, through our spirit, through our history, through our cultures, that we can heal things that our modern economies and our science cannot cure. But it's not an either or issue either. We need to, be have, we need to have skilled people who can bring the best of both and weave it into a third option with value added. Then we can move forward. But if you're only looking at a one or the other, I'm sorry, I don't think we're gonna to get to where we need to go. But anyway, those are, I may be wrong, but those are, those are my thoughts. Uh, Sherry, what, what is the feedback that you're getting from your business? I have a lot of questions here where people are very upset. They, they're losing their businesses because of the stay at home order. Do you have a lot of businesses that are also saying that it's time to get back to work? Almost, most definitely. Again, as I mentioned earlier, this virus is not immune to any type of business, regardless of industry, regardless, regardless of size of business, regardless of which island. Uh, so it is definitely um, having a, a tremendous impact on businesses and um, financially, but also the, um, you know, they feel awfully, they feel awful for having to cut jobs or positions and hours and because this is the livelihood of their, uh, of the communities, of their teams, of the team's families. And so, you know, there, there's this, um, I guess, again, urgent need or, uh, uh, an injection of confidence that is needed uh, to provide to businesses through relief measures. Uh, and so that's where here, and that's why we've been um, advocating for immediate relief. And we know that essentially uh, we will pivot and transition to, um, you know, opening our doors, um, restoring jobs. Uh, we know we will get there. And, um, and I'm sure there will be a public safety aspect to the equation now, no doubt. Uh, and how will that looks? You know, I think that's what um, uh, that's being worked on right now. But the stability, recovery, and resilience from screening, testing, to tracing, quarantine, that's all mentioned in many of these um, presentations that we've heard so far. Uh, but again, going back to the immediate relief, we need to support 
our business as much as we can, especially our small local businesses who need the resources. Um, we don't have the type of cash flow that's needed to be sustainable and to be able to con for them to continue to provide healthcare insurance to employees. I know some businesses have um, put many of them on furlough or had to lay them off, but continue to provide health insurance because they know how important that is. But there's again, a limited time frame for that because at some point with no business, they're not gonna get, um, they're not gonna be able to sustain those types of contributions. And so, uh, uh, you know, whatever type of relief we can get right now, would be extremely helpful. And, uh, you know, and we know we have to do our part when this, once this is, once we get past this, and make our contributions as well. Well, before, um, we also have uh, some questions or comments from our Facebook feed. And um, this is from Casey Connors with Keep the Country Country, I believe. Um, Stop over tourism, grow ag food, grow higher income, film, TV, digital media, music, um, you know, better education for our youth. And I think all of us and agree that we need to start doing that um, based on things that were being told by, by Tusi and a way forward. Um, uh, we have someone, uh, James McKay, said mahalo for hosting this topic. I agree with Dr. Tusi. Are there any specific examples of innovation and motion anyone can speak to, such as new farming programs or land protection allocation? to grow more local foods, employment, and community. You did speak about um, the breadfruit um, initiative. Uh, are there other initiatives that you're aware of that can get that to us at that point? Me? Yes, two seats, sorry. Uh, I'm looking at you thinking that you can see me looking at me. <laughs> the, uh, um, there, there are actually quite a few, which I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled, um, but, Many of these deal with vegetables, uh, which are, are very good, and um, imported sort of uh, vegetables and, and, and uh, agricultural products uh, of, of that nature. What we're focusing on are what are the native indigenous um, uh, plants, uh, fruit-bearing trees, uh, because they have demonstrated resilience over the millenniums. So they're not going to need all the chemical support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, that, that would be needed to enable them to thrive. Uh, the, the reason why we're also looking at the breadfruit is because we now have the science behind it to support the byproducts are incredible. The biggest problem we had with traditional foods and, and agriculture is there was very little business science behind it. A lot of it was just biological science or, or ag science, so to speak. Now when we're looking at huge markets and things of that nature, this is what Shiler Business College brings to it. We're able to, to, to weave and see, wow, there's, uh, there's tremendous opportunities. Uh, so we're building on the strengths that already exist. And uh, the va value added is simply the, the, the research and development from the universities and, and from the various experts. Craig Elevich and agroforestry, uh, that is one of our experts. The guy's amazing. If you want to grow breadfruit and, and agroforestry, he's part of our pool of experts. Susan Merch at the University of British Columbia, biochemist. A lot of her research has pointed out and led us into the direction of many of these byproducts. Uh, Jeff Gwertz, Kansas State University. These are leaders in uh, milling and flour making in the world. So these are the kinds of individuals we tap <clears throat> so that we're looking at businesses past restoring, restoration. We're looking at the next phase because uh, we'll need at least 100,000 new trees on the ground um, this year if, if we're going to really build up our, our, our local capacity. Uh, otherwise, collaboration with the region, 80,000 farmers from the Pacific collaborating on, on, on a product that can make a national, a state, and a global impact is really compelling. Meanwhile, um, we should always support 
agricultural initiatives wherever they are in the island. If it's good to eat, help it grow. I think you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> uh, just, I've just been reading all the different questions and comments and, and again, a lot of people want to know when uh, we can get back to work. And Sherry, what is your analysis of that based on the many different meetings that you've gone to um, from both the health perspective and the business perspective? Did anyone present to you uh, a type of phased approach of who gets to open and when they're going to open? Oh, you're on mute now too, Sherry. <laughs> I think this is my million Zoom probably, and I still forget to unmute myself. Um, yeah, there have been discussions about that. You know, we want to make sure, I know the, the governor has been talking about it. Uh, the House Task Force has been talking about it, and there's been presentations on it um, most recently as of Monday. Uh, as we phase in um, this approach, this, this next phase, and, you know, I think we need to ensure that the health aspect of it is in place, as I mentioned earlier, uh, making sure we have a process for screening, uh, testing, tracing, and quarantining, because this is not going to go away. Um, and if it does, uh, there's, we've heard that it may come back. Um, we may come back in different forms, or we may have a different situation. So we want to make sure that we are ready for that. Um, I know they're looking at which businesses um, should be given priority to opening so it minimizes the potential impact of uh, um, 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 spread of the COVID, uh, re-spread rather. And then so I know, you know, these discussions are going and again, it's critical that we have the health aspect of it in place and ensuring so that we don't go back to the same situation um, again. So there's the stability phase, recovery, and then resilience. Um, but we're hoping, I mean, obviously we all want uh, to open our doors and restart our econo economy and have businesses to, um, on that runway, you know, getting ready to take off. But we need to make sure this, the health and safety safeguards are in place first. I believe that because we've done such a great job of, of lowering the curve and and have less cases uh, coming forward that we are getting to the point where we are ensuring that we are keeping the virus out of our city. Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that we need to open some types of businesses, uh, but it all depends on how we can continue to control the virus. We have got to find a way to test everybody that comes here. Uh, that truly is the only solution if we want to completely open up our economy again. And it is my hope that that is something that is going to be possible. There are some cities that are finding a way to test every single citizen in their city. And I think that should be at top of our priority. We, had a yeah, question. We, want, we want to minimize the, you know, the risk, obviously, and keep as low risk as possible. And then another aspect of visit to ensure that uh, there's enough PPEs and cleaning supplies as we move forward because that's definitely going to be a part of operating a business. And so I, I know we've been having a challenging time finding those as consumers. But so if we start opening doors, we want to make sure we have um, sufficient supplies and equipment to be able to um, operate in a safe uh, and healthy way. Uh one of the things moving forward that people uh, want to know is um, how do they keep their business open when they're supposed to stay closed? What are some of the examples that you have seen, Sherry, where people are finding a way to adjust aside from, of course, the um, hand sanitizer and, and to-go orders? And so, so what are some of the what are the, some of the other things that businesses are doing to make adjustments? Uh, we've heard in the mainland that some restaurants have turned into small little markets mm -hmm. so that they can reopen again. Is anyone talking about things like that? Just recognizing that they cannot just not open something. 
yeah, I think many businesses are finding their own creative ways to uh, adjust to bridge business operations model, um, whether, yes, selling um, groceries from the restaurants uh, or repurposing some of the products for different um, usage. Uh, and also many businesses, obviously, it's, uh, they're, they're working from home. I mean, with Zoom and other technology, uh, we're able to have that kind of uh, continued operation and communication. Uh, so we're definitely operating in a different way now. Um, and so I think businesses are forced to, uh, to come up with creative and, again, that word innovative ways to uh, keep their businesses afloat as well as think about it as we move forward. So Shar Pohl, and this is the last comment before we do our summaries um, from Y9. Thank you, Shar, for, for commenting here. This time of change is a great opportunity for us to move off of dependency of less Pono industries, methods, and yes, develop Pono local beneficial compatible and progressive solutions from within. Innovation is talked about here and for us here that greatly encom encompasses ancestral knowledge paired with the 21st century technologies. And we also want to thank um, Kamiwana Enos of Mao who also contributed to that comment. And with that, uh, Sherry, did you want to just give a summary of the next step that the Sh Chamber of Commerce is working on to ensure that uh, Hawaii can get back to work safely, of course, and uh, and the things that you're going to be hoping to do to, to help businesses. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to be on your Zoom call. Always great seeing you. Uh, and Dr. Tusi, good to meet you virtually. Uh, you know, we've been, um, again, in connection and communication with membership as well as the broader business community through our various partners in getting the pulse of what businesses, um, their, what you know, the status of businesses, the needs of businesses, um, what are the plans moving forward? So it's critical that as a chamber, as our mission, as a voice of business and advocate, that we continue to provide that information out to um, our, our different stakeholders and then working with government collaboratively uh, to ensure that the business, especially the small business voice, um, gets heard and that we implement measures to help them survive as well as thrive. Uh, and so when, when you, you know, Asked when uh, we ask for information or do surveys, uh, we encourage and we urge uh, those businesses to respond to them uh, because it's uh, critical that we have accurate information and data to ensure that the plan that we uh, are working on, as well as the state is working on, reflects what the needs are as we shape uh, a brighter future for Hawaii. Thank you, Sherry. We'll continue to work every day is a different day. Yes. So Tusi, can you give us some knowledge that will give us some hope for the future that yes, we can open up Hawaii again and, and have an economy that is less dependent on the outside world? Well, well first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to serve on the panel. Pleasure. Nice to meet you, Sherry. Look forward to getting together again in the future. Um, a message for uh, for for I don't know so much as a, as a message as, as it is an intuition. Um, it's reframing. Um, let's look at solutions that grow instead, you know, using terms of growing instead of building, healing instead of fixing, regeneration instead of sustaining, and localizing instead of globalization. This state depends on over 90% of its, of its food security. Um, you, we can take care of getting people to work, yes, and we can uh, mitigate the uh, COVID-19 issues. But once that's over, the next great challenge, unless these uh, supply chains get sorted out fairly quickly, is going to be food security. If you really have nothing to do, I would suggest instead of standing and sitting in long lines of cars to get the cost you list, or, or standing in long lines uh, at, the, at, 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 at the store, uh, hoping there's still food on the shelves. Go out and plant a breadfruit, a banana, uh, something that you can eat. That's better use of your time. Anyway, we're happy you. to 
help in any way, if there's any interest following up, please let Kim know and we'll get on her right away. Aloha. Aloha. And there's a lot of questions we didn't get the answer. I want to let you know that we will either answer it through Zoom or through Facebook. I'm so honored that you folks joined us today and I'm so sorry to many of you that are suffering out there. But there's one thing that I believe during this crisis and it's the one place that you want to be uh, during this crisis. It's in Hawaii. Hawaii has the right culture, the right people to find a way to survive. We will thrive after this crisis because we are the one type of people that will come together and ensure that no one is left behind and no one suffers anymore. This is the best time for us to look at what Hawaii was and get rid of the things that we didn't like anymore and start dreaming big of what we really want Hawaii to be like. And I can tell you the Hawaii that I want is not the one that's dependent on other people to save me anymore. We need to find a way to make our own money, create our own business here, and save the environment, take care of each other, and most importantly, feed ourselves. Well, until next time, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. And we will have this on Facebook for you as well as Zoom for you to review anytime. Love all of you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Aloha.